we're waiting for everyone to come in. Look, I'd, I'd like to um, do a, a, a few things first. Um, I'd like to um, acknowledge the uh, First Nations people that we're all meeting on our country uh, today. Um, we pay our respects to um, uh, elders past, present and emerging. And I think it's also important for us to recognise, you know, to think about what small things we can do to help that reconciliation process. Now, um, thanks also to everyone who has jumped in on this conversation and more importantly, jumped in on uh, this campaign. You know, we, uh, Kelly Grenop and I have been doing this for 11 years and, and we still are surprised that we nag all of you guys to, to participate and you all um, hey, willingly do how it. Are you? Good, how are you? Uh, um, uh, we really appreciate that from, from everyone and, and we are super grateful. Now, speaking of, of, of grateful, uh, we've got uh, two speakers uh, today and the aim is to sort of have a chat uh, around about you know, 15 minutes-ish even a bit less each, just a short, sharp presentation, really just to, to open the conversation because what we're really interested in is um, to, to hear um, stories and experience from, from people who work on the front line, um, sort of dealing with those pathways um, from insecure living arrangements to secure. Because I think what we all need to do in terms of uh, addressing homelessness is always have a housing first approach and uh, finding ways to move people into safe housing should be our aim at, I think, at all costs. And that's really a philosophical approach. We, it doesn't mean that we ignore people sleeping rough, but there is so much damage that gets done when, when people are on the streets for, for any period of time. So we need to avoid that. So um, uh, I'll speak about Alana Grace uh, first. Now, Alana, um, is with Churches of, of Christ, but uh, she's been instrumental managing a, a, a program um, uh, called Youth Connect. And it's a program that the Sleep Out has, uh, during when it was um, initiated, was a, was a big sponsor of. And really what it is, is about um, looking at uh, supporting younger people uh, who have come from state care and uh, precarious housing uh, into more sort of stable situations and providing wraparound support. Now, the, the, the point where Second Chance sort of intervenes, I guess, or, or gives money, because we, we, we don't run our own programs. We, we support a really broad range of programs, something uh, like the, uh, 21 shelters, I think, and dozens of programs from far north Queensland all the way, to, you know, sunny coast, Gold Coast, southeast Queensland, all over the place, Townsville as well. And so um, it, it's programs like Youth Connect that we, we try and support through targeted ways. And I think in this instance, and Alana will speak a bit about it, uh, is um, uh, sort of looking at helping out with bond um, and uh, first weeks of rent. So... Aside from working with Churches of Christ, um, and she's uh, the, pra the uh, program development officer um, in charge of Youth Connect, um, uh, you've always been in that sort of uh, care space. And I think uh, your work has always been as a case manager, your, your degree is in counselling. And so you've seen a lot of things and, and it's it's pointless for me to try and express the, the the challenges that you guys go through because you you know you've got first-hand experience so we look forward to hearing from you now fiona terry um uh works with uh, mission australia but uh she's much more than that and uh, uh i saw fiona um presents down at the ahuri uh conference for homelessness um no housing sorry um, down in Melbourne uh, in March earlier this year. And she was um, one of the uh, large number of people talking about the, the risks of, of older women and, and the risks to homelessness. Um, she's been uh, working on, on programs as well as sort of her day-to-day -day, uh, interactions with, with older women to, to 
you know, improve um, the, I guess, those pathways and, and journeys uh, into safe housing. And, and it's it's really a complicated and, and challenging um, uh, space to be in. Now, uh, Fiona, you, you're, you're originally from a, a nursing background um, and uh, mental health um, uh, sector, but, you know, I think a lot like other people here, you're, you're a passionate advocate, which is why you're going out of your way to share your experience today. And we really do appreciate it from both of you. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Alana and um, uh, let her share her screen uh, if you want, or you can you can just talk at, at lib. It depends on, on how you're going to do it. And if there are any questions, you can pop it into the chat and I will try my best to sort of walk and chew gum at the same time um, and monitor that as well. So over to you, Alana. Thanks, Michael. Um, can you see my screen? Did I share it okay? Perfectly. Amazing. Thank you. Oh, well, thank you so much for that introduction. And I do really appreciate, I do want to say thank you from Youth Connect for all the support that Sleep Out has given us over the years. It has absolutely been the difference between someone being able to get into a private rental and um, sleep being quite rough. So we are very, very appreciative of everything that Sleep Out campaign has done for us. Um, I'm going to talk about the Youth Connect program today. So our program is designed to support young people after leaving care. Um, oops, there we go. So care leavers, um, I was just going to give a brief overview of the sort of cohort that we're looking after. So across the last, like, oh, it's sort of been an upward trend, really. We've been seeing an increasing dependency of our emerging adults groups, so the 18 to 24s across Australia, relying on their families, um, really due to lack of affordable housing. Obviously, this group is working lower income jobs and uh, quite often not being able to afford rent, so relying on their families and living in their family homes for a bit longer than what we were seeing. Thing, you know 20 30 years ago um, when we're looking at out of home care young people though so these are people who are either living in like either foster care or also residential care they don't really have that kind of safety net in a lot of situations so the sector as a whole is really concerned that leaving care without any kind of support post 18 really puts that unfair um, demand on young people we also know from research that young people leaving the care system are really vulnerable and facing a lot of hardships. So the CREATE organisation, who are an advocacy group for care leavers, are reporting that close to 50% of care leavers actually experience homelessness within the first five years of leaving care. Um, that's obviously a huge, huge number. And then if you put on top of that, this is a cohort that is um, consistently reporting under employment or unemployment at higher rates than their peers who are still grew up with their families and also um, lower levels of educational qualifications when again comparing with their peers too. So contributing to these sorts of outcomes is also like higher instances of mental health, um, definitely drug and alcohol dependency issues as well, offending poverty and debt. So care leavers and their advocates are also reporting that their time in care um, has led to, they've been seeing a history of abuse and a loss of uh, resulting in high levels of mental health issues, yeah, substance abuse, that sort of thing. So we know that this group is really vulnerable and the Youth Connect program was really designed with the idea that we want to be able to have a program that supports these young people and being able to see them achieve better outcomes, particularly around homelessness. So our program was aimed to improve the resilience of homelessness for young people exiting state care. That was really like our very broad overall aim. Um, the Youth Connect program is quite unique in that uh, it was funded through a social benefit bond. It's one of the first ones in Queensland to ever occur. So a social benefit bond, I haven't gone into a whole heap of detail. It's a form of um, impact investment where private investors, so I believe that Westpac maybe was an investor in ours, provide working capital to an NGO like Churches of Christ to establish and operate a social service that is aim to achieve really specific outcomes. So for Youth Connect, we were really aiming to have at least six months of safe and stable housing and at least 12 months of either working or learning or in cases of someone being a young parent, for instance, being engaged in personal development for those 12 months. So we accepted 300 young people um, who were deemed as the greatest risk of homelessness over four years, so between uh, 2018 to 2021. 
young people could be referred through two different uh, streams, I suppose. So the first cohort were young people between 15 and 18 who were exiting the child safety system who had had four or more placements. So the more placements someone has, the more at risk they are of homelessness. So we were really trying to target the most the people who had the most need. And then we also um, were accepting young people between 15 and 25 who were exiting youth justice, uh, adult corrections, or in contact with a homelessness service who had also had a past experience with the child protection system. Um, we were designed to support young people to move through four phases while they were with the program and the program was designed to be run over two to three years. At the moment, we're currently supporting around 120 young people and we're going to continue um, in operation until early 2024. Um, that's just how long the social benefit bond has been set up to go for. But I know the Churches of Christ is really hopeful that we'll be able to look at other transitional programs, particularly now that the age of care has been raised to 21, which only happened a couple of weeks ago so it was a very new development that we're definitely happy about. I just want to give a really brief overview of the sort of young people that we're working with. So Youth Connect is in operation um, in Logan, Ipswich and Townsville. And these are really big catchment areas. So the Logan was all the way down to the New South Wales border and then up to the south of the Brisbane River. And then Ipswich included all the way out to Toowoomba as well. And then we had Townsville, which had a smaller cohort of people, but we definitely supported young people in Townsville too. And then our referral. So you can see our biggest referral was from child safety, but we also accepted referrals from youth justice, um, NGOs, housing services. And then we had a small amount of young people who self-referred to us too. Typically those young people were ones who had friends in our program or partners. And then I've just included um, an age of referral. So you can see the vast, vast majority of young people were 17, which is typically when someone's exiting from child safety care. Um, but you can see we also accepted the 18 or 19 year olds. So those were young people who typically had exited from state care and had experienced hardship. And then we were able to support them post care. And yeah, we accepted referrals up to 25 and down to 15, but that was a smaller amount because those young people were typically still in child safety protection. In terms of the type of support that Youth Connect offered, we had case managers who typically worked with between 20 to 26 young people. That definitely moved around though during the program. And we also had support from support workers as well. Um, Youth Connect was definitely designed to be very holistic and very individualised depending on the young person and their goals. Um, I'll definitely say the biggest like um, goal young people had was absolutely getting into safe and stable housing. Um, we did have a head lease model as well. So that was when Churches of Christ rented a house in the private rental market and a young person was a subtenant, meaning that they have a rental history with us, but they still had the protection of um, Churches of Christ. Um, but we also linked in with other places as well. And we definitely supported young people to apply for private rentals if they were set up to do so um, and take over the tenancy under their own name. But we did a lot of other things in terms of like independence building. So cooking classes, budgeting support. Um, we absolutely did a lot of driving lessons. Young people were desperate to get licenses. Um, we did cultural connection support, which I'll get into a little bit later that household management skills stuff. So both looking after a tenancy, but also just doing chores, like how to clean certain things. Um, we did NDIS applications quite a bit. We definitely supported, a, um, I believe it was 18% of young people ended up having um, significant disabilities and we tried to support them to be able to get NDIS support, navigating relationships, parenting support as well. We ended up having about a quarter of our young people were young parents um, and then settling support, referrals to specialist services and that sort of personal development stuff. Um, we always endeavoured to see people face to face, so going on support visits, um, but we definitely found that sometimes young people moved around a bit and when they did we continued to work with them but we would give phone support and then do referrals in the areas that we moved. So I can think of people who moved to Western Australia and Melbourne, um, but we continue to keep in touch with them and make sure that they were well connected in their new network. So Youth Connect was a very new program and we knew that when we were first developing the model that we really wanted to embed a um, way to improve practice as we went along, I suppose. So we used a, this is for a action research model. Sometimes it's just called action research. Um, and we affectionately like just call it PAR, so P-A-R. Um, PAR includes researchers and participants both working together. So it goes all the way up to, you know, the very highest 
uh, directors at Churches of Christ, all the way to clients, stakeholders, their families, that sort of thing. Um, and the real aim of PAR is to, the very like short little synopsis is we like work together to make things better. So we identify a problem. It's a very democratic way of looking at things and we do things as we go. So identify a problem um, or get around, have a chat about it, try out something and then do a reflection. So it's a lot of cycles. In Youth Connect, we look at um, PAR as a way to embed and identify good practice and also build that culture of inquiry. So that understanding that we definitely don't have all of the answers and young people are the experts in their own lives. So what are we able to learn together as we move through? Um, we were really lucky that we were able to partner with the University of the Sunshine Coast, who really acted as consultants and like led the way for a lot of the research that we did. The university also um, did a lot of evaluation work in the Youth Connect program, and they've just published a process report, which I really love. It's quite long. It's about uh, 260 pages, but they did a lot of interviews. They did a lot of like file analysis. So the link's there, but I think that Michael um, has distributed a couple of like our different publications and at the moment we're working on an outcomes um, evaluation report so as the program winds down we want to say like what did we accomplish so through that PAR model, we really looked at um, the idea of homefulness. So a major question we were asking ourselves right at the beginning of the program was what will it take to achieve positive housing and homefulness outcomes for young people in the Youth Connect program? So the term homefulness is something that we really adopted very early on. Um, we really wanted a positive focus, not so much on the deficit-based idea of like homelessness, but the term homefulness, which really means that feeling of like safety, control um, and confidence that comes with having a place to call home so the idea that a home isn't just like four walls and a roof it's somewhere that you feel safe and secure in um staff were bringing to the homefulness par group um, a lot of different ideas and strategies on how to explore young people's perspectives on home and how these could be used to source the most appropriate housing for that individual, not like a collective, but that one specific person. Um, some of these ideas were turned into strategies that we trialled across like a lot of different like areas and with workers and different young people as well. So example I can give is um, workers sat down with clients and we like did drawings of dream homes. We had a bunch of cards with interpretive photos that we would say like pick out what means home and then have a conversation around that. Um, I know some people do collages, that sort of thing. And once we'd done all of those, the university helped us collect them and analyze for themes. And through that, we were able to come up with this homefulness model that has really become a big part of our practice. So to the um, right of the screen, these are the different elements that young people were talking to us about consistently of what was important and what made a home to them. So things that they were talking about was agency, so that freedom to be able to choose where they were living, um, having the ownership of not being told this is your only option basically oh sorry my cat's very upset um and then they also talked about the spatial aspects so we called that spaces and places saying you know it's important for me to live here so I'm close to grandma that sort of stuff um identity so people wanting to personalize their space express themselves particularly in terms of their culture um, young people definitely spoke a lot about the feelings that a home would give, so that safety and belonging sort of thing, and also both social connection and control, so who do they want to be able to live there, but also who do they want to be protected from and having a place that they're able to retreat and be in their own space. Um, I really love this work, I think it was really great, obviously as young people are finding a home, these all of these different elements are going to be completely achievable the first way around, but it was a really nice model to have something to work towards. Um, we ended up publishing a practitioner guide on how different services would be able to use this sort of model and this work in different services, which is downloadable as well. And then in terms of our cultural practice, so in out-of-home care, there's a really big overrepresentation of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander young people, and that was absolutely reflected in Youth Connect as well. I believe we had about 40% of our cohort who identified as Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander. So we were asking ourselves the question, what would it take to support Indigenous young people in the Youth Connect program to realise positive outcomes? Um, when young people were coming to us who identified as Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander and who had had a care experience, it was very common for them to talk about feeling very disconnected from their culture, not knowing who their mob was, where their country was. Um, 
but on the flip side of things, we also supported like a minority of clients who had really strong cultural connections, were very like um, involved in their communities, really knew like their ancestors and their elders. And we found that those young people who were strongly connected um, had a lot of better outcomes, basically. They had that really great support network around them. So we were really dedicated to helping Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander young people connect with their culture. And we did a lot of different strategies. So on the graph to the left of the screen, we were looking at different things that we could do from like the organizational level, but also our staffing group. So that stuff was more around like training, what we were doing, especially with non-Indigenous staff members, and then young people, what we were doing with young people. So that in included going on cultural tours, connecting them with, as you can see, like men's and women's business gatherings. Um, involvement in culturally significant events. Um, and then you can see where the overlap was as well, but all of that stuff was really captured within the community as well, like what communities were the young people focusing on. And again, we did write up a little article in the Parity Journal, which is um, downloadable as well. And lastly, this was some of the feedback clients have given us during that evaluation report I mentioned that the University of the Sunshine Coast had done. Um, I've obviously included like really <laughs> nice ones, but we're very proud of the program. Um, we've had really lovely feedback from clients, clients saying that the program really worked well with them, especially around, as you can see, um, around relationships, around cultural connection and setting and being able to meet goals as well. Um, yeah, we're very, very proud. And yes, we intend to be in operation until 2024, but hopefully we'll be able to do another iteration of the program. Mm. Super. Look, there's there's uh, much more to that than, than we spoke about before. And so that's, uh, no, I'm not talking about in terms of time, but just the, the way that you've unpacked the content. It was really interesting. And I've been taking down a bunch of notes um, because as architects, you know, we tend to be very solutions focused and so on. You think, well, how, how are we going to use any of this stuff? But I think what's brilliant is that it, it breathes life into the people that we're designing for. And there's there's lots of little strategies that you can start to drill down into once you have an appreciation of what housing means and should should be to people just more than you know a real estate asset. So um, so that that's brilliant. So um, if anyone has any any questions, you can put them in the chat and and I'll try and broker them uh after fiona has um has uh spoken um now uh, uh the the whole um you know women uh over 55 and and it's it's such a tricky thing because it, it's more than just um uh you know it, it it's it is more than sort of relationship breakdown because it is um you know, people having some form of equity, but but not being able to go into uh, social housing for a bunch of reasons. And so you, you're really caught. And I think, uh, and also a lot of people, I, you know, one of the common themes is that feeling of, of, of shame and and you know feeling you know, how do I get into this situation? But I'm 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 not an expert. Fiona's the expert. She's been working with this for ages. So I'm going to hand over to Fiona, and hopefully she can. Uh, uh, correct my assumptions to some degree. Thank you, Michael. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. I'm, I don't think I'm an expert. Um, I'm in this very much in this learning space uh, simply because this group that I'm going to talk about are often first time users of the sector. So there were some really uh, quite quite new learnings um, and really some in interesting and very curious outcomes that we had. So um, thank you, Alana, following you. I don't have such a beautiful presentation. I've got the IT issue, so I'm just going to speak, hopefully not at you. Um, so first of all, I'll just give an overview and of what the funding of the program was. Then I'm sort of thinking that uh, I will try and talk about what these first time users of the sector are in terms of what their experiences might be, um, understanding their needs, and hopefully that might be sort of help through the lens of um, architects, which is just invaluable to uh, the pathways that we are hoping uh, we might sort of get better at in, in the future. Um, so I guess to begin with um, this, 
little project, uh, we were given um, a grant from Brisbane City Council, Pathways Out of Homelessness, and a grant was almost three years and, and COVID, as everyone knows, was sort of in there. The project, uh, if you will, was three pronged. So part of it is working on the ground with the women and actually supporting them and assisting them uh, with whatever they might need. Then the second part was also capacity building into the sector and um, speaking with, um, I was able to speak with 29 different services in the sector, right from the Department of Housing to services that are, that are well known, to some really small ones, to even church groups. Um, and I don't say even because often we forget that they're part of the, they are part, what I would consider part of the community, the sector anyway, to help. Um, so uh, uh, interviewing um, and having a focus group with that group about what do they see as the perceived value uh, barriers for these older women and the challenges and how they might overcome it. And then the third part of the research was actually with the women. Um, and then there was also um, a par, part of research, that participatory, which was where they could if they chose to engage in photo voice as a methodology where they would take some photographs of their experience of their journey and that those photos could represent all sorts of different things. Um, and I can give a little plug about that exhibition at the end. So that was the program. Um, and we basically, okay, we're now going to sort of reach, try and reach out and how do we find what we are hearing is this very invisible group of um, older women, first time users of the sector. So I guess what I really found is um, whilst they share um, a similar experience of housing insecurity, they, they all have unique circumstances and they are not a homogenous group. So some of the things which I guess, um, and I won't go in because I'm sure most of us know them, so I won't break them down. So the systemic issues for this group um, are quite prevalent. So the gender pay inequity over the years, taking time out of the workforce to be carers, whether that's raising children, um, a loved one, etc., having lower paid jobs, um, lower superannuation. So those systemic issues, and then when we threw, throw in what's going on now uh, in terms of what COVID's brought, um, which is now loss of job, and a lot of those older women were then perhaps in some of the lower or casual workforce, lower paid jobs or casual workforce, and um, they lost their jobs through COVID, and now because of ageism, are finding it really challenging to get back in. And then you might throw in um, perhaps what we are more familiar with in terms of when we speak about homeless um, domestic violence, uh, breakdown in these relationships, then you throw in an unexpected health condition, a death of a spouse, uh, mental health impact, um, and you really have just got this massive systemic um, you know, bubble that is just always a, a, a very strong ex external pressure. So I guess then what I found was that they really were first time users of the system. So what does that really mean? So what that means is I'm an older woman and my whole life I have worked and contributed, whether that's to family, to community, loved ones in the workforce, and I've loved my home, I've loved my safe space, and I haven't ever worried about not feeling secure. And all of a sudden, that rug has just been pulled out from under me. And I don't even know where to start to find access. And I am experiencing I'm not eligible um, simply because now superannuation is not included in eligibility for Department of Housing, but your assets are in, and you're obviously not allowed to own a home. That can have complications for some women if it's if it's an ugly um, relationship situation and, and that, that can go sort of pear shaped. So they simply don't identify as being homeless as well. So whilst we, there's a lot of narrative around shame, there's also a very strong narrative that's come out of the research. They're really 
incensed and they, they're outraged and they're angry and they've got a lot of pride. And so I'm not, I don't identify with perhaps what the stigma that's attached to homeless people, you know, drug users, you know, losers, all that horrible, you know, what's called the sin and sick talk, which just keeps, you know, um, the really deficit language um, right across the board. And similarly, you know, as it doesn't go, it was interesting, you know, Alana spoke about it with the young people she's working with. Well, it's here it is right at the end. And I'm so my the eldest person that I've engaged with is an 81 year old and that's their narrative still. And I wow, just reflect how sad that is right across. So then I guess it was about understanding the needs of these women. So I'm hoping this much so women come with a lot of possessions <laughs> and these are treasured possessions. So now they're being told, okay, you've got to downsize out of this unit because we know that the rental prices, particularly here in, in Brisbane and Queensland, greater, greater Brisbane, is just at a point we've, level we've never seen before and affordability of houses. So that they're not going to be eligible for loans. They're not going to get a foot back in. So their options are to rent. So now they need to, this is in the private sector, because we know there's lack of supply. Sorry, I've made that assumption. Lack of supply in housing, but you know that, and I don't want to go down that road. And really that is a very strong um, reality for people. You know, Similarly, I wouldn't want to be in the Department of Housing having to uh, prioritise and triage uh, who is more worthy or eligible for the very limited houses that are available because we simply have ignored keeping up with um, building affordable and, and social housing. So the, um, lost my train of thought there, sorry, as usual. Uh, so these women then, okay, you know, where, where, can, I, where can I start to look um, with all my possessions? So storage, and they, they downsizing is really hard for them because these are treasured possessions. So when they move, they've, they can't, they've got to move now to a one room place. And what do they do with all their treasured possessions? You know, storage uh, places are really expensive and invariably um, moving into new places. There's, there's not any storage. There's a real assumption that older women, A, might not drive a car which absolutely got up the nose of the 81-year-old feisty lady that I was engaged with because she still does road trips. <laughs> um, so there's that. Older women will often have a pet um, and that is an absolutely huge part of their well-being um, and their life. So with that, they want a little whether it doesn't have to be big, but a little courtyard or a little space in the garden that's safe and secure and private. Um, they also, for those that uh, then will have a dog, invariably they are they are small. Um, again, they want to have you know fenced that those sorts of those sorts of needs. They need to be um, near to services. Uh, they need to the community of choice and what they know. Uh, is really important, um, particularly we know that with older people that very much age, you become very uh, discombobulated and overwhelmed when you're taken out of your very familiar environment. So it's such a key part of wellbeing to stay where your services that you know are and where your, um, you know, your supports are. So uh, I probably might not keep going on that there's a lot more sort of needs but then I guess it might bring me to about well what are the pathways so older women at the moment the pathways are department of housing spoken about what that situation looks like the private sector incredibly challenging because if you are on a pension um, and you're of any sort so whether that's age part pension superannuation DSP or job seeker you are then competing against people who are a double income or one income. And unfortunately, you, you um, are in a very vulnerable cohort there. Throw in uh, culture and First Nation and you are you're even more marginalised. So then it's about, okay, where, where else? So do we move back into family? Is there units? Do we have, you know, 
granny granny flats. Um, you know, I've been able some that has that is an option for some, not for others. A lot of older women with that pride factor don't want to tell their family their situation. They really feel, well, um, you know, my children are grown and adults, not their responsibility. I found myself here through absolutely no fault of my own. Um, and I certainly don't think my children are now uh, responsible, but you know, that can just tear and tug at so many heartstrings. And, you know, it's, I can't imagine any of us being happy with our mother, our grandmother, our sister, our aunts sleeping in a car um, and that's happening. Um, and couch surfing is, is similarly uh, happening. And it's pretty tough when you're 70 and you've lived in a unit for 20 years and you suddenly get told you're being evicted. Your world is definitely thrown on its head. So what do they tell me that they would um, like? And it, many models um, are, are what is needed. There's a lot of talk around co-sharing. Older women are very specific around what that uh, co-sharing might look like for them. They all want their own bathroom and that's just uh, not negotiable. They would like shared spaces. They want, um, so whether that's a laundry, a kitchen, some of the things that we might usually think about, but shared storage spaces as well. Um, and then also um, little spaces in the garden if we're doing co-sharing or whatever that can look like. Obviously ground floor and it's all about aging in place. Now, when I say obviously ground floor, I don't know why I said obviously, because there are lots of women that actually don't mind second floor, but they want low density. They, um, and they love intergenerational. It's really healthy. We know all the positive aspects of well-being when we can have intergenerational tenancy. So they love that. Um, what else do they? Uh, I think it's um, definitely the safety, safety, safety is really the number one for older women. So, you know, it's important that they have a gate, that they have a fence. They need to feel safe and secure. Um, that is absolutely paramount. And then I think, uh, yeah, the rest kind of follows on. So I'm just looking at the time, Michael, I won't keep talking because I can probably go everywhere and hopefully that was. That, that oops, am I muted? No, I'm not muted. That, that's uh, that's brilliant, Fiona. And I think the, it, it's evidence because uh, your capacity to, um, uh, to share with us in such a, a passionate and sort of open way uh, it just speaks to your experience and passion in, in this and you know we've we've had conversations beforehand and and to be honest I, I often sort of think far out this this is and I, I sometimes feel a bit hopeless because and and even in some situations you know often if it, if you've got family members in that that situation it really sort of brings it home so um uh, you know and and it's 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 one thing that to, to complain about, well, the, the breakdown of, of social connections. And I think that's the same in the, in the youth system as well, you know, um, how we, uh, you know, look after each other, but, you know, we're, we're not going to change that and, and society's moved on. So we need to find ways. One thing, um, and just while I'm wobbling here a little bit, I'd, I'd like to sort of open it up. We've got around 20 minutes and I've, I've got the chat open on the side. If anyone has a question or a comment, uh, can you please put it on there? I've, I've got one uh, uh, question, I guess, or two comments, really. Um, one, you know, a, a thing that we keep talking about as, as architects that we're missing in housing is what we call the sort of missing middle, the kind of suburban housing that's... Um, you know, low rise, you know, small numbers, say around sort of seven to 10. And, and you know, the, the Queensland uh, government through the um, Department of Housing and the state government architect have been working really hard to sort of develop that thinking. And it's surprising why that logical way of, of or that typology isn't more um, profound in, in our cities, because it makes so much sense. Um, the other thing, um, is is that you know what else um, you know I, I don't think there's there's any sort of silver bullet with any of these things but I think what we do need to do is is keep trying to understand the um, the the challenges and and the constraints so for example you know uh, 
uh, you were talking, uh, well, both of you sort of were talking in, in some ways about the homeliness and being able to have things like pets and, and you know, how, how do we sort of, you know, as architects even design spaces that, you know, having a pet or personalising it is possible without sort of these, these draconian um, restrictions in, in the private sort of rental market. And sometimes it's these little decisions that can uh, have a big uh, impact and understanding the, the sort of context of it is uh, important to sort of reveal those. So that's one thing that that um, I took away. Um, I think the other big thing that that I've been also um, acutely aware and and I've had long and potentially heated uh, conversations with uh, other architectural colleagues uh, in in running the sleep out is you know architects aren't the solution, although often we think we are. And you know our, our our capacity to to create change is, is perhaps limited, but um, I'm not sure um, because you know many small moves can make a difference. But Alana, I think what I didn't appreciate in when when you showed me your presentation at the start with the the par the uh, you know the um, uh, active research um, sort of more collaborative uh, approach seemed to yield a lot of um, very specific um, let's even call it like briefing. Uh, elements that architects can use very well and again it, it's I'm surprised that we we don't do more of that and there you know if anything that we can sort of build bridges between the sectors that you guys work in and the sectors that we work in so that we better understand each other to to understand where the, the crossovers are where we can both make a difference so I don't know if you had any any comments on that and and Fiona you 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 have to not forget about you know, telling us about the the exhibition as, as well. For, um, but um, while we, we've got some um, sort of comments uh, back from either Alana or, or, or Fiona, um, the, the the chat on my side is um, uh, surprisingly uh, 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 empty. So I'll I'll just keep filling the air. But and uh, you'll. Uh, You'll regret it. So, if anyone has a a, a comment, we've got about ten minutes um, uh, to go, and um, uh, and and we'll put it forward. But is there anything, I guess, Fiona and Alana, you could, you know, what what's what even, you know, what's a one take home message that you wish architects knew, or something, you know, even if it's slightly offensive, because uh, you know, architects need to know that they're not the center of the universe as well. I would um, definitely encourage people to look in, if you haven't already, look into action research models. Mm -hmm. um, our consultant from the University of Sunshine Coast is called uh, Phil Crane, and he's written a um, like a participatory action research guide, basically, on how do you use action research within uh, programs regardless of the size so he's I know that he's used them for very very small targeted programs that are designed to work with you know 20 people and then bringing it really um right out as well mm. um I've definitely been converted to the action research space when I was a case manager I did sort of think oh, this is extra work that I have to do on top of an already very busy caseload but the results of just being able to have that targeted time to be very reflective and be looking at that big picture it's been incredibly rewarding mm. yeah and um I, I think um you know we um uh you know uh, we as as architects it's really hard you know that that process we're very sort of strong process basis for our work and and we've got to reclaim that so we're, we're not being told how to do things but we we sort of explain you know why it is that we need to do these these things and even if there's capacity in in larger offices and collaboration with uh, academia like proper productive collaboration with academia these things can have a lot of value um fiona um sophie um uh has has um made a, a point about the lived experience conversations. Um, Sophie, did you want to put the question to Fiona direct or have you got access to the, the chat there, Fiona? So where has your lived experience conversations gone? Are they contributing to policy and is there further research? So this is for Fiona. Thank you, Sophie. Um, 
So, yes, they have um, certainly been, hopefully they're contributing to policy. So there has just been uh, an announcement with the Department of Housing for a older women hub. And the women over 55 group with all those conversations were able to come to the table and input exactly what, you know, older women's needs were. And from that, they have now given a four year grant. It's a Brisbane based hub. Um, I believe it's opening in September and it will be specifically um, a one stop shop, if you like that language. It's based on the HARD model, which is the housing against the age in Melbourne, which has been a very successful uh, advocacy and also a service which provides information and, and pathways for um, specifically older people experiencing housing insecurity. So that's where they've gone. Um, and no, so I'm hope, I think they have contributed to policy. A lot of it, um, yes, it still goes in there and thank goodness for all those researchers and academic, you know, we're, we're putting in research with the University of South Australia, but sometimes I, you know, the government, they know it's there, but I guess they don't always pay attention to it. Um, and, Further research, um, well, I guess this is the other part of it. <laughs> we, I, I would like to see research done where the academics actually do it with the practitioner. And I think that maybe that was similarly what um, Alana was talking around, you know, uh, excellent academic researchers can pull huge amounts of money, but they then come into a space and do it, but it's, yeah, without the practitioner and without, you know, I think exactly that um, that PAR research would be invaluable. So do we think there's further research needed? Um, do you know what? We don't need another white paper on this stuff. It's all there. <laughs> we know exactly what's needed. There's so much uh, here in Brisbane, we're really, um, I guess, incredibly lucky to have uh, Dr. Cameron Parcell, who just is phenomenal in his expertise and the books and the papers that he's written about this. And yes, it's action now. We need action. We don't need any more stuff, Sophie. We, it's here. So um, obviously in my role with Mission Australia, um, I can't be that um, hardcore advocate, but when I get a chance, as in, you know, but when I get a chance, don't worry. Um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm aghast as why we don't have people marching over bridges and um, as we did about, you know, the um, gay rights marriages stuff, you know, aren't we just appalled at our housing system? So, yeah, anyway, that's enough. Sorry. Uh, I think it's it's really important. And I think Sophie and, and Fiona, I'm not sure whether you guys know each other, but but you're, you're definitely swimming in the same pond. Um, and... Uh, uh, if if you can't find it, I'm sure you can, but I'll I'll point you into the to the work that Sophie's doing because it's brilliant. Um, now, uh, I I think that's the other thing that we can all go away from this, is, and just every time we get an opportunity to our politicians, our, our at all levels of government, is just build more houses. <laughs> it's it's pretty simple, and um and it. Every time we have a conversation, like we had a great interview with Karen Edwards from your town, who we also support, and she says, look, you know, it, it's great that I'm saying all of these things and it's great that Second Chance give us all this support, but there's just not the housing to move people into. So the, the pathway is blocked through lack of supply. So there, there's not enough capacity and there's not enough um, uh, fluidity to, to be able to respond to situations and, and to have that sort of granular approach. Now, what can architects do about this? I'm not sure. You know, we, we, we sort of architects, I guess, in one, one hat and advocates on the other. And I think we all need to, to, to uh, push that agenda. But, you know, again, any time that we sort of think, you know, how do we get flexibility and, and adaptability in our housing stock? You know, how tightly wound are our, our, our um, uh, properties uh, that we design you know are, are we just simply looking such a narrow lens and I know when we work for the private sector developers have very specific requirements but we just have to keep chipping away and if, if we don't know what it is what the problem is and we don't know where the aspirations is then we, we've got you know we're kind of going up the river without any paddle so it's um uh Danny uh 
Um, can you see that, Fiona? So you talked about ageing in place and older women wanting to live in locations that they are familiar with. So have you noticed uh, women being displaced due to recent... It, it's a really good point you make there, Danny, because uh, gentrification seems to be the 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 golden standard you know you go to any you know planning institute australia talk and it's all about renewal and gentrification but there's a there's a flip side to that um fiona i'm just sort of wondering whether you can um respond yes. to Danny's. Yes, certainly um yes definitely experiencing that danny um and i can i'll speak to sort of one of the the suburbs we're familiar with uh, West End so I can, I'm thinking of one particular lady she's lived lived in West End all her life she's now 68 and that suburb has become gentrified and she has now been forced out of the property market so unfortunately she had to sell her the family home in West End um, eight years ago due to a marriage breakup and now she's not able to get a foot back in the property market. So yes, they're definitely being displaced and all her services are in that area. So what she's familiar with and um, she actually gets around in a, um, in a scooter. So even more um, relevant for her and more crucial for her to be able to stay in that, in that area. Mm. So what are the solutions? Well, <laughs> um, you know, for this particular lady, I went to 18 different real estate agents and spoke with them um, and asked. I felt like we were having, uh, we were being discriminated against and I would often, I would call it out and I would say, you know, I'm wondering if there's some age discrimination going on here or is there disability discrimination? I'm, I'm, I'm a good advocate um, for others, so I, I'm not backward in that. And it was interesting once I started to have used that language and that dialogue respectfully, all of a sudden, oh, we're getting offered a place because that is exactly what happens. Mm. Um, what are some housing solutions? Well, I mean, it's been really interesting in this role. Um, I've been contact. I went on uh, the rate the radio um, in the very beginning on drive time, Steve Austin, and he's a great he can he can speak you know he can push all the buttons and he can he can be uh, inappropriate and not professional and doesn't have to worry about diplomacy um you might get the idea that perhaps i don't worry about diplomacy too much either but <laughs> it's just like you've got to be realistic what's going on um so he from that it was astonishing and it wasn't an outcome I expected. The number of people in the community, uh, including a couple of church groups that contacted me and said, I've got a property um, underneath my uh, space, underneath my whole house, because normally I'd have a relative come and stay through COVID and they're not coming. So I would like to do that. Now, that was quite a unique situation because obviously I can't brokerage that because um, I don't know, you know, you can imagine all the the you know, how do you mitigate risk with that? However, it was just as rather than making it more complex than it was, I'm very much the optimistic person. It mm. was like, you just need to have an RTA agreement and just get really clear expectations. So that was through that, I was able to have four women were housed successfully, which was just amazing. Um, but yeah, I, I think it is about thinking of other places. You know, can we be differently? I mean, I, I'm often wondering, you know, what goes on with the ECA when, um, I'm thinking of pitching up there after the all the beautiful farmers have been in there and where they all sleep up there. I mean, that's got to be better than sleeping rough or in your car. Mm. So I think, it, yeah. So anyway, I won't keep talking. Sorry, because <laughs> you know I can. That, that that's that's uh, that's great. Your your passion is infectious, uh, Fiona. But you know, there, there's a bit of a, a dirty word amongst um, uh, particularly demographers and planners and so on a little bit, which is inclusionary zoning. And I think there's there's a bit of oxygen in that that we need to breathe into. And as well, the the sort of elephant in the room is that you know, I think in the last census, there's close to a million houses on any night that aren't being occupied. So. You know, there's, there's, there's surplus, but the people have just got, you know, their cold hand over the top of it. And, you know, clearly there's not a long-term solution in, in tapping into those, but there's certainly some, uh, you know, transitory arrangements that would take a little bit of pressure at, at certain points if if we could figure out a way to, to tap that. Look, I am going to have to... Uh, 
uh, call it a day. And and look, thank you, um, Alana and Fiona. It, it's I'm always surprised that I ask people to do these things for free and take their time and and uh, uh, and um, you know it, it, it's uh, I feel guilty but also inspired that um, you know you're you're so willing and forthcoming to share the knowledge. Um, anyone who's who's still here um, that is is part of the team, please, 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 um, you know, start you know building some narratives and have the conversation and and let's build some momentum around the uh, fundraising because a lot of these uh, support mechanisms uh, rely on really granular, small contributions. You know, remove list, buying a new SIM card for your phone storage costs and these are the costs that that second chance directly support so all of the things that that facilitate that mobility and pathway is what you're raising money for so the more that we can do the more people we can help and and uh, we thank everyone for for dropping in i'll make the um uh i'll i'll figure out how i'm going to make the uh, recording uh, available in you know, a digestible format. Um, I'll share some of those links, uh, uh, Alana, that you had on your presentation. Um, and Fiona, if, if you've got any information about the exhibition that we can, that you can share with me um, offline, I'll um, then distribute that to the rest of the team because I think we'd be interested in that. So thank you everyone for your attention. Thanks Alana, thanks Fiona, it's been brilliant. And uh, next week, um, We'll be doing this again, um, focusing a bit more on design. So thanks, everyone. Cheers. <laughs> thanks, Michael. Brilliant. Cheers. See you guys. <laughs>